Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Purple Martins like to live around people and are entertaining to watch. Today, we're going to check in on some. Also, scales can be a major insect pest. That's just ahead on the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mary Smith. Mary is the Backyard Wildlife Center Curator here at Lichterman Nature Center, and Amy Dismukes will be joining me later. Hi, Mary. Hey, Chris. Always good to see you. Great to see you too. Happy to have you here today. Yes, thank you for inviting us to be here today. I'm so excited. Yes, this so is going to be a really fun day. This is going to be fun. So what are we going to be talking about today? So we're at our Purple Martin colony. Yeah. Now, usually this colony is 10 to 15 yeah. feet up in the air, but we brought it down mm -hmm. because we're going to check it today. We're going to open cool. up these gourds and see what's happening inside. Cool, let's do it. All I can't right. wait. I can't wait. Okay, so the first thing is when we're checking the gourds, never look in the hole. If there's still a bird in there, it's coming out right at your eye. So we've got nice access on the side. And so we're just going to open this side up okay. and Sure enough, we've got something in there. Oh, how about that? So, so do we have to record what we find? Sure, so okay. we check our gourds every mm -hmm. five to seven days. We okay. record what's in there, if there's eggs or young, and then we age the youngs, which I'm gonna have you help me do right okay. now. Okay. So I'm gonna pull one of the birds out. Nice. A lot of times you'll hear not to touch baby birds because the parents will abandon them. Oh, look at that. But the birds don't have a great sense of smell, not like we have a developed sense of smell. So okay. they actually can't smell you on, on the babies. So they're not gonna abandon the nest if you touch okay. them. Best thing is always to put them back in the nest. All right. But what we can do with these is we can actually age them. How about that? Okay. So it looks like we have a nine day nine. old. Okay. Nice. And then in here, he's got a total of five nine day old young. Okay. Want to look at another one? Yeah, let's do that. That is so cool to see though. Yeah. So in this one, it's a little bit different. Okay. I think that is so cool. Can I hold that? Sure. That? Wow, look at that. We've got a total of four eggs in here. What's unique about Purple Martins is they're only laying one egg at sunrise and they don't start incubating until the next to last egg. Wow. I know, we, there's a lot of research on purple martins for us to know that, but it's really good because then we know when they're gonna hatch and when they're gonna leave the gourds as well. So at sunrise? Yes, always at sunrise. So when we check them, okay. um, we know that uh, one egg had just been laid that morning. Okay. So I've got one more I'd like to show you, okay, one yeah, more gourd I'd like to check with okay. you. All right. Right around this way. Okay. Okay, so same thing, you don't want to look inside. Right. And as you as we're looking at these, you probably notice some of them look a little bit different. Okay. And the reason is there's different predator guards. Okay. One of the most important thing if you're gonna have a purple martin colony is to make sure you protect it. And the best way to do that is adding predator guards. Okay. So we've got predator guards for ground predators like raccoons and snakes. Okay. Um, this is just uh, bird netting. If you put that around there, snakes can't get through it. So Got we've it. actually caught a few snakes trying to get so in the colony. So they just get tangled in it. Okay. Exactly. Got it. Okay. You'll see some bars yeah, overhanging. Yeah, I wondered about that. Yeah, okay. so these are for aerial predators, things like hawks and owls. They can stick their foot right there and grab a bird or a young bird. So these actually give them a little bit of space so the birds can't get that close okay. to the entrance. Okay. And then lastly, the entrance holes. Um, the entrance holes are to prevent starlings and sometimes house sparrows from getting into your gourds. Got it, okay. Because they'll go in there and try to make nests or something exactly. like that? Exactly, and they will okay. kill the young birds and sometimes even the adults. Okay, let me ask you about this one. Is this Sure, so um, this is really interesting. So this colony has been here for over 10 years. And when we first started, we had four active nests okay. and we had gourds all like this. Well, unfortunately, these ones, like I talked about, where predators were able to get in there. Okay. Um, and so we started retrofitting them over the last 10 years, slowly changing and adding predator guards. Mm -hmm. 
Chris, this year we have 33 active nests. We have over 120 eggs. Um, some of them have already hatched, um, but we had a, over 120 eggs. So this that's year. the most that you all ever had? It is. Oh, this is the most that? for our colony. Nice. So check out this one. Oh, oh my gosh. Look at so that. this is just a one day that. old. This one yeah, just hatched one yesterday. Day. Oh my goodness. How about that? I've never seen one that small before. It's and he's got old. three other uh, siblings in there as well. Okay. So one of the reasons that we check the purple martin gourds, because a lot of people think, well, aren't you bothering the birds? Yeah. Aren't they going to abandon the nest? And with all the research that's been done, colonies that are monitored or checked on a regular basis okay. are more successful or they fledge more young birds leave the nest than okay. ones that aren't monitored. We can uh, find out things like predation, okay. so predators. Um, we can, uh, starlings or house sparrows if they're getting into our yeah. nest. If we have something like nest mites or parasites, those are things that by checking it, we can find and address those problems before they become an issue. So how often do you check? So we're checking our gourds every five to seven days. At around day 26 or 27, okay. the birds are able to fledge or leave the gourd or leave the nest. Right. But sometimes if they get spooked a few days before that, they might leave the nest early before okay. they're able to fly. And so by putting a plug in it that has a long string that we can pull out once the gourd's at the top, those birds aren't gonna um, fly, a come out of the nest a couple days early. Okay, so when do they start flying? So really they're gonna start flying around day 26 or day 27. Um, and that's when they're gonna that's leave cool. the nest. And that's it, they don't return back to the nest. Wow, and that's it? That's it. Yeah, so they probably don't like that we're here right now, do they? Or they probably don't they understand that we're bit? doing, we're trying to help the colony, <laughs> but um, as soon as we put it back up, they're going back in, feeding their young, incubating okay. eggs if they still have eggs. Okay, got it. So let me ask you this, and I know you talked about this before. So what do they eat? Great question. Okay. Purple martins are insectivores. They're insectivores, only okay. eating insects and they're only eating flying insects. <laughs> Almost everything they do is in the air, even getting water. If you watch really? purple martins, they'll fly really low over water and just dip their mouths in and get a little bit of water. Okay. They're also catching insects as the insects are flying as well. So good mosquito control maybe? Well, I don't know how many mosquitoes they're eating. Yeah. They're definitely eating a lot of insects, but a lot okay. of times they're going for big bugs. Big bugs, okay. Big payoff, because they've got young, they've got to feed. It's not to say they won't eat mosquitoes, but they're looking for the best payoff for them. Okay. What about survival rate? How, how long do they live? That's a great question. So, um, you know, for any young bird, the first year is always hard. Yeah. For these birds, yeah. they're migrating all the way down to, say, Brazil. Really? Um, so, and then coming back again ar around late February. Okay. Um, so, that's a really tough for a first year bird. So, first year survival rate for most birds isn't very high. If they can survive their first year, sometimes they can live to be seven or eight years old. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. Those same birds are going to be coming back to the same colony. They come back to the same colony year after year. So, they know how to do that? Yeah. So, if you attract purple martins if you have a colony it's important to maintain that colony because the same birds are coming back to use it every okay. year every year every year okay so is it best to have you know gourds like this or so you have options okay. yeah so um i like the gourds okay. i definitely want something that you can open to check and also be able to take down and clean at the end of the season. Ah, okay. But there are other styles. There are apartment or condo styles. <laughs> as long as you can op open those and they have predator guards okay. on them, you're good to go with those as well. Yeah, predator guards, very important. Predator guards, really important. Can't say enough about those. How about that? I think it's so neat that we get a chance to do this. And Absolutely. Of course, they're just flying around us. Like, they what are. are you doing the here? sound is great I too. Like it. And they're really fun to watch. I think it is good. Well, Mary, we thank you so much for this. This is actually pretty cool. Yeah, pretty thanks cool. for coming out. Thank you much. Thank you. Look what we have here. This is slime mold. Some people call it dog vomit. It actually feeds on decaying organic material. So it's feeding on this mulch that's around uh, this tree. You usually see slime mold when you have wet conditions. So right after the rain, in about a week or so, you'll probably see slime mold. Here's the thing about slime mold. It is not harmful to plants, to people, to the environment. It actually lasts for about a week or two, and then it'll go away. If you want to get rid of it, there's a couple of things you can do. Get a rake, just rake it out, or get a scoop and just scoop it out. Uh, you don't have to worry about spraying a fungicide or anything like that. So again, slime mold 
also known as dog vomit. Pretty cool. All right, Amy, let's talk about scales, specifically the difference between soft scales and hard scales. Hey, hey, make your skin crawl. First off, <laughs> right. um, this is one of my favorite programs to give, by the good, way, because good. by the time I'm finished, everybody in the <laughs> audience is doing this. Uh. <laughs> or either this. They're terrified. And I think I've said something really horrible. <laughs> but um, yes, so scale insects. Scale are, most people don't know what scale are, mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. They're teeny tiny. Um, they're very inconspicuous. Yes. They're probably one of the most destructive insects in the landscape because of that. But there are soft scales and there are hard scales. Okay. Soft scales are different in that, I guess I'll try to say this. Soft scales, they both feed on sap. They're right. phloem feeders is what we call them, along with many other insects like aphids mm -hmm. and mealybugs. But there's a difference. Soft scale actually emit honeydew, sure. just like aphids do, right. whereas the hard scale don't. That actually makes them much more difficult to control That's right. because they feed a little bit differently. So in saying that, we'll go ahead and jump into that if it's okay. Mm -hmm. These guys right here, these euonymus scale, which is one of the hard scales, and you guys can actually see it is pretty Covered. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that because yes. I have you run on the scale at home. This is a major <laughs> pest. It is. And then we also have the white peach scale. And despite its name, the white peach scale does not occur just on peaches. This mm. guy, this is actually on laurel because, wow. yeah, laurel's in the peach family in the, the prunus. Right. We forget about that mm -hmm. one as well. But the reason they're difficult to control is the hard scale is actually feeding right on the outside of the phloem. So what insecticides we'd normally use to control are not gonna control, control it well. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of control, but not a lot. Okay. So that brings us to the next step on how to actually take care of those guys. All right. So I guess in treatment, that is the difference. We have to use a systemic or can use a systemic with our soft scale which would be something like imidacloprid, sure. dinotepheron. Right. But as we know, again, relating back to our pollinators, there are specific times of the year that we do that right. and specific times we don't. We okay. do not use systemic neonicotinoids on flowering plants, um, the extended versions of those. There are some shorter lived products that have a much shorter shelf life. So we're out of the system of the plant by the time we have blooms. Good. But as for our hard scale, this is where it gets really crazy. It's tough. These guys, we actually have to attack at the juvenile stage. So scales, what most folks don't realize and why they are also very inconspicuous is they lose their legs once they start feeding and they blend into the plant. <laughs> so they camouflage well. So they really uh, do camouflage. Yeah. That just kind of explains again, it's really, it's really hard. difficult. So these guys, because they're not feeding right in the phloem, that insecticide might get them just a little bit if we use a systemic, but it won't get good total control. And we want control of the hard scale because unlike soft scale, it can produce multiple generations a year, dependent on the weather. Now what's the weather like here? Hot, humid. There we go. We have high temperatures, yes. humidity. That's perfect, perfect breeding ground for these folks. Perfect. Now, if we were up north, it wouldn't, you know, probably one generation, it's gonna yeah. freeze it out, but not here. Yeah, you run on a scale here in the Memphis it's area, crazy. we're looking at three generations. Three, three right. minimum is yeah. usually what they say. Mm -hmm. But what we normally do with this, I tell people, let's start in the spring really early, get some nice double-sided sticky tape, and mm -hmm. we're gonna trap those crawlers. Huh. When they begin to hatch in the spring okay. is how you control hard scale. Right. We hit the crawlers with an oil spray. Mm -hmm. We can actually use a juvenile retardant spray, a growth regulator, something like okay. Talus. Uh -huh. um, but the other thing that we can do is actually prune them off when we have a lot of tissue that's infected. Which is what so, I do. Yes, right. that mm -hmm. is usually the step with euonymus scale because they get so out of hand right. very, very quickly with our area here. Okay. Um, 
Let's try to think about the other differences. I guess one of the differences, now we do have some nice samples here of these, these very infested hard scale plants, <laughs> but one other difference, hard scale is much smaller than the soft scale. Okay. It's much more inconspicuous. Soft scale often will look like, I've compared, uh, let's say the Florida wax scale. When this guy actually develops on the branches, it looks like little wads of, wa of bubble gum. Okay, a different way to look mm -hmm. at that. Oak lacanium scale will layer itself on a branch of an oak, a willow oak or something, and it looks like little marbles yeah. laid on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the other big difference in our scale insects. Soft scale doesn't have armor. So All when right. you open that scale up, you're pulling the whole insect off of the plant. All right. Very likely, you may see some eggs under there. Sure you will. <laughs> but hard scale, it actually has an armor that lifts off. One of the other reasons it is so incredibly difficult to control. That armor is like a raincoat. It's no fair. No. Mm -mm. It's no fair. They know. are just built for success. <laughs> it kind of seems to be what it is. Yeah. But I think also it's kind of one of those, uh, they take out the weakers. Mm. So these guys really don't build up a whole lot until we might have some other plant stressors. Sure. Okay. But. Wow. Lots. Lots. Now, nice going, going back to the soft scales mm -hmm. now, you talked about the honeydew. Yes. All right. What okay. About Let's talk about honeydew a little bit. What it produces or helps to produce. This is that stuff right here called sooty mold. Yes. Sooty mold, I always tell folks when they say, what? I say, <laughs> you know the cars you see driving around uh -huh. in the summertime the thing. that uh -huh. are covered, uh -huh. the, just the tops just the and tops. maybe the, right. the trunk and the hood are black, Yes. but it's a silver car. That is sooty mold. Sooty mold. Yeah. That happens when you park under a tree mm -hmm. that has an, a sap sucker, we'll call it, okay. infestation, and All that right. can include many of the bugs, specifically soft scale as well. Right. But what's happening is these guys are voracious feeders of sap. And we know that sap has carbohydrates and sugars in it. Right. And that's why we call it honeydew. honeydew. It's sweet and it's sticky. Mm -hmm. So these little fellows are feeding on sap and what their bodies cannot ingest comes Get out, out in the liquid form. As our friend David Cook in Davidson County says, what goes in liquid comes out liquid. What goes in <laughs> oh, solid God. comes out solid. Uh, yeah. This applies for insects as well. Right. So uh, I always like to tell people as well, if you've ever been walking under a tree and you get dripped on and it's not raining. And it's not raining, I say the same you've thing. You've been pooped on That's by right. a sap sucker. That's right. So <laughs> the next step on that, now it's excellent obviously if we can recognize that honeydew and we see those shiny right. spots. But if we don't, we may begin to have what we call sooty mold. Sure begin to develop on this honeydew. So the honeydew is actually a great media, I guess we'll call it. It's sticky, so these sticky. mold spores that are just blowing around in the air, normal, not pathogenic mm. to plants, not really pathogenic to us, they're able to stick to this honeydew because the honeydew is sweet, it sporulates and is able to grow. It's a food source right there and it sticks to it. Honeydew. Honeydew brings on sooty, sooty mold. mold. Sooty mold ruins fences, cars, and patios. And so patios. we can actually stop this by recognizing that one thing. Good stuff, Amy. Yeah. We appreciate that. Absolutely. Honeydew. Honeydew. Sooty mold. It is not the honeydew list. Yeah, it's not the honeydew <laughs> list. No, it's the bad honeydew. one. All right. Thanks, Amy. You Good got stuff. it. All right. We have an infestation of, of uh, mealybugs on our mandevillas here. We're going to spray them with uh, malathion. Malathion is an insecticide uh, that's labeled for use on, on mealybugs. According to the label for mealybug control, uh, it's one tablespoon is recommended per gallon of water. So I had to do some math. This is a little over 12 ounces. That's about a tenth of a gallon. A tenth of a tablespoon is equal to about 1.4 milliliters. I actually have a, a measuring spoon, which is 1.25 milliliters. So I'm gonna put a little less than my 12.8 ounces in here to make it match my 1.25 milliliters. So, you know, you gotta figure all that out. It's so very important to, to follow the label instructions. So what I'm gonna do, fill this up about half full. Now I'm going to uh, try to get my 1.25 milliliters of malathion in here. I'm going to shake it up and then I'm going to top it off with water. Okay, got that, and I'm going to shake it up again. 
okay? And see, I got some on my hand that leaked a little bit. That's why you wear rubber gloves. Very, very important. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Ready. These ready. are great questions. All right, here's our first viewer email. It's interesting, right? I planted two Tonto crepe myrtles on April 1st this year. It is June and they still have not started to grow any leaves. Is there something I should do? They are both about four feet tall and have several stems that are branching out at the top. I followed the planting directions and have been watering them regularly. I peeled the bark back in several places and it's bright green so the trees are not dead. Mm -hmm. Should I expect anything from them this year? And this is Todd from Myodin, North Carolina. So Todd is actually putting in a lot of work. Yeah. Right, he knows to water them. He's been following the directions. He peeled the bark back. I'm glad he said that. See, mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. So there's green tissue. Right. Um, what is the problem though, you think? Uh, what could potentially be the problem, I, Jess? I'm thinking they were just planted a little too late. Okay. Um, in general, you want to plant your shrubs and trees in the fall. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking maybe he just got these started a little bit late and they need more time. And uh, as long as he's doing the scratch test and it's green under there, just keep um, keep just waiting on them. I think they'll be okay. Yeah, what yeah. do you think? Give it some more time and you should start to see some, some leaves develop. Yeah, I think uh, you just have to be patient, right? Mm -hmm. April the 1st. I mean, it's, yeah, okay. it's not that long, not that long ago, yeah. right? So just give them a little time. I'm sure with the warm weather there in North Carolina, mm -hmm. yeah, it'll take off pretty quick. You yeah, know, just keep watering, keep watering it. Keep watering it, right? Um, maybe it came with fertilizer, you know, depending on the like, the gallon container that it was in, it usually got already fertilized, so that's probably already taken care of. Just keep it watered, uh, keep checking on it, warmer temperatures. I think it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it'll be good. So thank you, Todd. Yeah, you've done a lot of homework on that. So yeah. we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, here's our next viewer email. Can I cut my water lilies that are turning yellow without hurting them? And this is Deborah. So what do y'all think about that one? Well, I think like we were talking about, once a leaf turns yellow, mm -hmm. it's not really feeding the plant anymore. So you can get rid of that without really damaging the plant. Do you want I that agree. Just? 100%. Yeah. yeah, go ahead and cut that back, right? Mm -hmm. um, for plant health sake, mm -hmm. right? And then something else I just thought about, water quality. Oh yeah. Right, yeah, that's really important, water quality. Because uh, as those are breaking down, they're getting into your water system as well. Leaves. Build mm -hmm. up from the bottom, all that stuff breaking down, cause more oxygen, sometimes can affect um, your aquatic life mm -hmm. to fish, turtles, things like that. So I, I would definitely take them off. I would take them off, all right because you definitely don't want to hurt that aquatic life that you have down there with the bacteria and things like that, right? right. So yeah, go ahead and uh, cut those off, Deborah. I think that'll help you out, right? Because y'all have a lot of water lilies here, don't you? We have American lotus, which is lotus. An, a yeah. native plant. Okay. looks very similar to, to lilies, okay. um, but a slightly different plant. Okay, got it. All right, so thank you, Ms. Deborah, for that question. We appreciate that. All right, here's our next viewer email. Oh, yeah, this is a good one, right? Mm -hmm. So last year, I tried growing yellow neck squash in a large pot. They did really well until some big, ugly bugs attacked. They bored out the stem near the ground. How can I stop the bugs that bored out the stem of my squash plants? I don't use pesticides, so we gotta remember that. This is Constance from Dallas, Texas, All right? So Mary, what do we think that the culprit is? Who is that culprit? Okay, so I think the culprit is a squash vine borer. Yes, it is which is actually a moth, a moth. Mm -hmm. but it looks like a wasp. It does, it's, yeah, it definitely it's does. It's actually a moth, and what's happening is the larvae are boring into the stem. So it's a challenging one, mm -hmm. but there are some things that you mm -hmm. can do to try to prevent that from happening. Right, so it's definitely a challenge because as they're boring into the stem, they're disrupting the flow of water, mm -hmm. right? to the upper right. canopy of the plant, so the plant collapses, right? Right. Or to collapse. And once they're in, in that vine, it's almost too late. It's almost too late. So there's a couple of things you can do, right? So you can get a knife, mm -hmm. you know, razor blade or something. You can actually cut the stem, see if you can find it. Yep, this, but you gotta be careful You gotta be careful. Too. You gotta be careful with it, but if you can find it, get it out, mm -hmm. of course, kill it, all right? So and you can actually mound up soil around, you know, that wounded area in hopes that it will produce roots. Yes. That's one way. Mm -hmm. The old timers that I know, guess what they do? They wrap aluminum foil around the stem oh, of the plant. Yeah, right. that prevents them from getting in. That's interesting. Prevents them from getting in, right? Yeah. And from the moth laying the egg yeah. on it. Yeah, you're right. Right? So there's yeah, something else you can do too. I know some people that dust uh, spinosad. Spinosad is a soil bacterium. It's considered to be a green product safe. Um, read and follow the label on that if you use it. Uh, that's another method. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And finally, look for resistant varieties. Yeah. Or, we talked about this, plant early. Or, or plant late. <laughs> So yeah. the moths are active um, in the summertime, but usually they're done by July. Mm -hmm. So if you plant late, if that's possible in your zone to plant it late. Yeah. The other thing you want to keep in mind is that they pupate underground in the soil. Mm -hmm. So if you had a problem in that area last year, rotate crops. Crop Don't plant your squash there the following year because they're in the soil right. and they're going to attack again. So rotate your crops from that area. Rotate your crops. Yeah, because after about four weeks, you know, they pretty much drop into the ground and pupate. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm, yeah, you might want to yeah. rotate your crops. Yeah. That'll definitely help. Or I know she said in a pot. So Yeah, this um, is a pot. Right. Yeah. This is a pot. Fresh soil. Fresh soil. Right. Exactly right. So this is a pot. Uh, fresh soil. We'll definitely do that. Um, but yeah, squash vine boards are tough. Yes. Tough. A lot of people don't plant squash because of squash exactly. vine boars. Uh, that can be a nuisance, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that question, Constance. And one last thing, Constance, check with your local extension office there, Texas A&M Extension. They will have a publication for you about squash vine boars. All right. So Jesse, Mary, that was fun. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about Purple Martins, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have another video about those interesting birds. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.